Hey guys, my name is Catherine. Thank you for joining me again for another episode of Missing the Missing. In this episode, number 13, we're going to be talking about Ruth Wilson. So before beginning, I'd just like to give a shout out to skepticpeg.wordpress.com for their full and detailed analysis of Ruth's case and their effort in keeping Ruth's case alive. I have leaned heavily on their article for this case. Ruth Wilson was born on the 31st of January 1979 in Surrey, England, to parents Ian and Nesta Wilson, who had married three years prior in Newport, Wales, in 1976. Ruth would share her bedroom with her younger sister Jennifer, with whom she was very close, in the family's 17th century cottage in the affluent village of Betchworth. Sadly, when Ruth was just three years old, and her sister Jenny, as she is known, was younger still, just a baby. The mother, Nesta, passed away on the 10th of December 1982. A year later, Ian, a secondary school teacher and later head of science department, married a primary school teacher, Karen Bowerman, who also went on to become a deputy head teacher. Ian did inform the girls of their mother's death, that she had tragically fallen down the stairs and broke her neck. And the girls, despite this, went on to call Karen their mum. The girls went to Ashcombe School on Warnham Lane in nearby Dorking, with academic achievement and homework being a priority in the Wilson household. Ruth had recently passed her GCSEs, or General Certificate of Secondary Education, and stayed on to attend the sixth form, like a college if you're not from the UK. There we encounter the initial discrepancy in Ruth's life. Ruth has been described both as not cool, with a small circle of like-minded friends, as well as being popular and having lots of friends. Wherever the truth lies, according to her teachers, Ruth was doing well. She was studious and studied chemistry and biology to advanced or A-level, with a view to studying archaeology at university. Her friend Catherine would later go on to say that Ruth didn't talk about her ambitions, she worked hard to the detriment of exploring the things that kids do at that age, like fashion. But she had this really wicked sense of humour. This was supported by another friend of Ruth's, Roxy Birch, who described her as having a good sense of humour, lots of varied interests and being incredibly intelligent. Outside of academics, Ruth was described as a confident, well-mannered and traditional, but unconventional girl who tended to undervalue herself. She enjoyed cycling and could often be found reading in the local library. She was so trustworthy, well-behaved and reliable that she was often asked to babysit for many in the local community. She was independent-minded and led a busy life, having a great love of music, particularly pop and traditional styles. She worked in a music store on Saturdays and played the piano and electric guitar. She was also in a youth club. Coming from a religious family, the girl's father Ian later became a local parish councillor. Ruth was actively involved in her local church, St Michael's, where she rang the church bells, was due to carry the crucifix in an upcoming mass, and in keeping with her love of music, joined the choir and played the organ. Ruth was known for her generosity of spirit and, all things considered, appeared to be happy and settled though her parents have acknowledged that there were the usual teenage frictions. In the lead up to her disappearance, initially there wasn't much noted as out of the ordinary. She had recently separated from her boyfriend, William, due to an undisclosed reason. Will has recently stated he doesn't want to be identified, and so in the interests of maintaining his wish for privacy, I will not disclose his surname, though the information is readily available. Despite their breakup, the two remained good friends and continued to be close. In fact, on Saturday the 25th of November 1995, Ruth had worked her usual shift at the music store in Dorking and then went out to an Indian cuisine meal with Will and his friend Neil Philipson. More on this later. The next day, Sunday the 26th of November 1995, Ruth attended hand bell ringing practice at St Michael's Church and subsequently attended a local youth club in Dorking. Following this, Ruth went to Will's house for supper, where his mother had given Ruth some old clothing. 
She spent the rest of the evening at her home in Betchworth, where she and her sister Jenny tried the clothes on, laughing at the funny old-fashioned clothes. The girls then raided their mother's wardrobe. I'm unsure if this was their stepmother Karen's wardrobe or if the family had retained any of Nesta's clothing. Either way, her family remembered Ruth as being relaxed. At the time of her disappearance, Ruth was a 16-year-old Caucasian female with a fair complexion. She was described as 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 3 inches or about 157 centimetres tall, with dark brown, shoulder length hair and blue eyes. Ruth normally wore metal rimmed glasses and was last seen wearing a red knitted jumper, black velvet trousers, black pitsy boots and a small ladies watch on her left wrist. Some sources claim she may also have been in possession of a small blue duffel bag with a personal stereo and tapes, not further described, though the majority of sources dispute this. On the morning of Monday the 27th of November 1995, the Wilson family arose as per their usual routine. Ruth's father Ian had an Ofsted, Office for Standards and Education inspection, and hurriedly pushed past Ruth, who was listening to her Walkman on his way out. He would later explain, quote, I remember being annoyed with her and said something like, out of my way, I'm in a hurry. I'll always regret those were the last words I ever said to her. Karen also left for work that morning, customarily leaving Ruth, 16, and Jenny, 13 years old at the time, to get the bus to school together. It wasn't uncommon for Ruth to have study sessions where she would not be expected to attend the school premises. However, it was unusual for Ruth not to tell Jenny about it beforehand. That morning, either whilst en route to or just prior to leaving for the bus stop, Ruth told Jenny she had a free study period and would make her own way to school later that day. It has not been confirmed whether Ruth did indeed have a free study session that morning. Either Ruth remained home that morning or returned after the walk to the bus stop, as a short time later her ex-boyfriend and close friend Will turned up and offered her a lift to school in his car. It's unclear if this was routine behaviour or out of character, but either way, Ruth declined, stating she would see him later. Presumably, Will attended school as planned, though Ruth's movements from that point have confused many who've looked into the case. Instead of going to school, it's believed that Ruth stayed home until about 11.30 before ordering a taxi that took her into Dorking. According to today's route planners, this would take four minutes on the train, the stations being just one stop apart, though a car would take about ten minutes to get there. It wasn't extraordinary for Ruth to get taxis, but her reasons for doing so that day are unclear, as there are also buses that travel that route. At about 12 midday, Ruth went to Thistles Forest at 257 Dorking High Street and ordered an expensive bouquet of flowers, not further described, to be delivered without a card to her stepmother Karen, allegedly explicitly stating that they were not to be delivered until Wednesday the 29th of November two days later. At some point after this, Ruth went to Dorking Library, where she stayed until about 4pm. It is not known what Ruth was doing during the hours she was at the library. Ruth then walked to Dorking Railway Station, which was between a 10 to 15 minute walk, where she took a taxi to Box Hill, an area of outstanding natural beauty that should have taken a further 10 to 15 minutes. Just as a quick note, sources differ as to the order of Ruth's activities that day, with some claiming she went straight to the library before and others claiming she attended there after the florist. I'm unsure of the reason for the discrepancy, but all sources eventually converge at about 4.30pm that day when Ruth is dropped off by the taxi driver at Box Hill. Specifically, it is noted that Ruth was dropped off or asked to be dropped off at a bridal way near to the Hand in Hand pub, which is now called the Tree on Box Hill, or the Box Tree. The taxi driver remembered watching her in his rear view mirror as he drove away in the fading light and rain. It struck to him as he noticed that patrons would usually walk off to some direction after being dropped off somewhere, whereas Ruth just stood there as if she was waiting for something or someone. 
The last confirmed sighting of Ruth was at about 4.30pm by the taxi driver who dropped her off before heading to his next pickup. It was two weeks before the 13th anniversary of her mother's death. When Ruth failed to return home that evening, her parents assumed they'd forgotten one of her many activities. Quote, At first we thought she must have been babysitting and that she'd forgotten to tell us or that we'd forgotten to write it on the calendar. But as the evening went on, we realised something was wrong. When evening turned into night with no word from Ruth, the family's concern grew and they contacted Surrey Police. That night, Surrey Police commenced the investigation beginning with a large-scale search, which would ultimately cover 1,000 acres of local parkland. Dogs, helicopters, and even heat-seeking equipment was used, but there was no sign of Ruth, until two days later. On Wednesday the 29th of November 1995, an expensive bouquet of flowers was delivered to Ruth's stepmother, Karen Wilson. There was no card. There was no special occasion that anybody was aware of, no significance of the date. It was later reported that on Friday the 1st of December 1995, Surrey police found three notes hidden under a bush in the undergrowth at the top edge of Betchworth Quarry on Box Hill. It was rumoured that these notes were written by Ruth and were addressed to her parents, her best friend and a male friend. Police have never released the contents of the notes but have declared that their contents were ambiguous. Allegedly nearby were found an empty packet of paracetamol and a half-empty bottle of either vermouth or vodka. It is not known if the bottle or pills were forensically tested, though they may have been contaminated by the presence in such a, a public place. It is not known if Ruth was known to drink either of these alcohols. As the search progressed, school friends told investigators that Ruth would often go to Box Hill after school on her way home, though her reasons for doing so are unknown. By Saturday the 2nd of December, the Fire and Rescue Services joined the search for Ruth, and 60 volunteers, including local members of the public, school friends, and colleagues and wardens from the National Trust. Betchworth Quarry was searched by experienced search and rescue teams, as well as with employees of the quarry's owners. On Friday the 8th of December 1995, Granada TV's breakfast programme This Morning featured Ian and Karen Wilson as they appealed for information in the case, in the belief that Ruth was alive but afraid to come home. A month after her disappearance, the Wilsons were interviewed by the Times newspaper, appealing directly to Ruth. Quote, we love you dearly. We miss you terribly. We used to grumble about the sound of your electric guitar twangling away. Without it, now the house is just dead. Since you left, the piano hasn't been touched. It is now a house without music. Whatever the issue that drove you away, or you found difficult to cope with, we will do everything in our power to sort it out. Despite multiple appeals, there was no word from Ruth. No phone call, no financial activity, no leads. There were reportedly CCTV images from the florist, being the last recording CCTV sighting of Ruth, with the last official sighting still believed to be by the taxi driver at 4.30 on Box Hill. Ian would later go on to say, quote, he knew it wasn't quite right in hindsight, leaving a 16-year-old in the middle of nowhere. As the investigation progressed, Ian and Karen Wilson acknowledged that, in a household where scholastic success was sought, maybe Ruth had been pushing herself too hard. It was later revealed that Ruth had begun to worry about her school grades and had hidden a most recent school report from her parents the weekend before she vanished. The National Missing Persons Helpline used their resources to further the reach and the search for Ruth, and the case received a decent amount of media coverage with Ruth's picture featured on body shop vehicles. Over time, there were some credible sightings of Ruth in the local and wider area, which were, according to a police officer, some fairly reliable sightings of her in the Dorking area by people who knew her well. A student from Ashcombe thought she saw Ruth in Dorking after she disappeared. Another witness, who was a couple of years younger than Ruth, claimed she knew her and saw her walking along the Rygate Road holding a navy blue suitcase on the day or day after Ruth went missing. Five months into the investigation, 
Police Constable Mark Williams Thomas, who was the family liaison officer in Ruth's case, wrote and submitted a report, detailed what he described as a number of inadequacies and fundamental errors in the investigation. He explained, the report went to the superintendent, but it was never signed to indicate that it had been seen. The force never formally acknowledged the points I made. I got no actual response at all, other than the report being handed back to me. To the best of my knowledge, no action was taken. The search was just not done well enough. To be absolutely honest, Ruth could still be up there. There was also a lack of sufficient house-to-house -house inquiries and numbers of people were not spoken to until later on. The officer's statements have received a mixed response, however, as later he would eventually leave the force under less than desirable circumstances. Though he did also state that, in general, the force had improved its procedures significantly for finding missing people since Ruth's disappearance. Eight months after Ruth disappeared, police questioned her friend from sixth form, Catherine Mayer, and searched her home in Sheffield to no avail. It later transpired that when she had dined with Will and Neil Phillipson the weekend before her disappearance, Ruth had paid for the meal and told them it would be something to remember her by. She did have a Saturday job at the music store, but without making any cash withdrawals and with no subsequent activity on her bank account or card, it is unclear where she got the money to pay for the meal, the taxis and the flowers. The investigation into Ruth's disappearance was assigned the name Operation Scholar and continued to follow up leads and sightings though sadly nothing has come to light. Whilst there has been some dispute about the conduct of the police investigation, the Wilsons maintain that, quote, the Surrey police were great, swept straight into action and were one of the most positive forces. On the flip side, however, Surrey police had at the time a negative image due to alleged problems within their senior command team, though those that commented on it did specify that there were no issues over competence or corruption. There have been sporadic attempts to shed light on the case over the years, though there appears to be at least the perception of reluctance from both the family and the local community to speak out for unknown reasons. To date, the case is still classified as a missing persons case and is reviewed regularly under the current leadership of Detective Chief Inspector Alex Geldert. There are conflicting reports as to whether or not the case is still open, though it seems unlikely as Surrey Police have stated, quote, the investigation will be reopened on receipt of new information or lines of inquiry. On the 1st of October 1996, after a live TV missing persons appeal, it was believed that Ruth was seen on the outskirts of London. The incident was published in the People newspaper on the 6th of October. A year after Ruth went missing, on Friday the 29th of November 1996, a teenage girl was captured on CCTV footage in a local Dorking newsagent shop, just two miles from Box Hill. The girl was alleged to have asked for various newspapers, which would have, at the time, been running articles on the anniversary of her disappearance. The shopkeeper at the time described her as distressed, visibly upset and emotional when she was told that at least one of the papers was sold out and reported the matter to police. Initially, the Wilsons denied that the girl in the footage was Ruth, though over time became convinced that it was, stating so in the Times newspaper on the 2nd of January 1997. It is unclear what made them change their minds. On Thursday the 9th of January 1997, the case was featured on the BBC2 programme Southern Eye Presumed Missing. In February of 1998, as part of the missing campaign, the Iceland food store chain put Ruth's picture on their milk cartons to raise awareness. On the 15th of December 2002, journalist Martin Bright wrote his first article on Ruth's disappearance, published by The Observer. On the 10th anniversary of Ruth's disappearance, Sergeant Shane Craven, head of the Missing Persons Unit for East Surrey Police, stated in the weeks following Ruth's disappearance, there were some fairly reliable sightings of her in the Dorking area by people who knew her well. In early to mid-2006, Sergeant Shane Craven launched a new appeal for information in the case. There was hope that someone who was unable to speak out at the time of the disappearance 
may feel confident enough to come forward at this time, though sadly no new information was obtained. The same year, 2006, Ian Wilson wrote an open letter to Ruth, which was published in the Mail newsletter, where he explained, quote, We still have the presents we bought you for Christmas in 1995. In late November to December 2008, there was a possible sighting of Ruth in Canada and a new appeal was launched. Sergeant Caroline Zamir from the Missing Persons Unit said, 13 years on, we still don't know what happened to Ruth after she was dropped off by a taxi at the Hand in Hand pub on Box Hill. We remain interested in hearing from anybody who thinks they might have met Ruth or have seen her during the past 13 years. The investigation into her disappearance has never been closed. To confirm, it had not been closed by that point in time. Ruth would have turned 30 on the 31st of January 2009. The occasion passed with no new information. In March of 2010, Ruth's old friend Roxy Birch made an appeal for information on the Missing Live BBC programme, calling her a brilliant friend and claiming that there were signs that Ruth had planned to disappear. In the same year, on the 15th anniversary of Ruth's disappearance, there was a new appeal and Ian Wilson, her father, wrote another open letter to her. He said, quote, Our greatest wish is that you are safe and happy and that one day you will make contact and be part of our life again. We have never stopped loving you and missing you. We love you. In May 2012, Missing People featured Ruth as one of the cases including in the Big Tweet for Missing Children campaign. In 2016, Sergeant Terry Hardy from the Missing Persons Unit said in a statement, Over the years, we have followed up many possible sightings of Ruth, but we still don't know precisely what happened to Ruth after she was dropped off by the taxi. Ruth will be in her 30s now, and I hope by relaunching the media appeal, someone who knows where Ruth is, or Ruth herself, comes forward and is able to end the distress suffered by Ruth's family. In May 2017, Surrey Police continued their appeal for new information in Ruth's case. In 2018, there was another new appeal in a local newspaper, requesting people to come forward if they have any information in the case. Ruth's friend, Roxy Birch, who had portrayed Ruth in a previous reconstruction video, stated that, quote, Ruth didn't drive or own a passport at the time, as far as she was aware. So you have to ask yourself the question, where could she have disappeared to? Also in 2018, Chief Superintendent of Public Protection at Surrey Police, John Savile, stated, There are five explanations for Ruth Wilson's disappearance. A tragic accident. Abduction suicide, murder, or that she had absented herself to start a new life. More on these theories later. The same year, a documentary called Vanished, the Surrey Schoolgirl was produced, in which a retired Metropolitan Police counter-terrorism officer, Liam McCauley, and a journalist, Martin Bright, investigated Ruth's disappearance. New witnesses came forward and new information was uncovered. Ruth's parents were invited to take part in the documentary to raise awareness of their daughter's case, though initially they did not respond to a letter sent by Liam McCauley. They did subsequently respond to Martin Bright by saying, quote, I've made the final decision that I don't wish to participate in this particular project. I know that you will do a good job and your part is going to be very professional, like you have always been in the past. But it's a complicated one and I've made the final decision. You can probably tell from my voice that it's quite an emotional one. Surrey Police also declined to take part in the project and when Liam McCauley submitted a Freedom of Information application requesting details of the investigation, the request was rejected on the basis that the case was still ongoing. No police documents were released. At the time, Surrey Police maintained that the case remained open. During the investigation for the documentary, Catherine Muir, along with some of Ruth's other friends, came forward and painted a much different picture of the situation for Martin Bright. Ruth's ex-boyfriend and close friend, Will, explained that Ruth was a troubled teenager who was unhappy at home. This sentiment was echoed in Catherine's statements, where she explained that Ruth was really troubled, she was unhappy, really unhappy. She cried with me about things. 
Catherine disclosed that she had been planning to move to Sheffield and advised that Ruth had asked if she could come with her, but that it was not possible at the time. She didn't want to be there. Catherine's mother also spoke in the documentary, adding more weight to the darker picture being painted. She explained that Ruth had slept over in their house not long before she disappeared and that she'd been adamant that she didn't want to go back home and that it made her feel very uncomfortable. As for the reasons behind Ruth's apprehension, Catherine claims she was secretive about that. She didn't go into details. Though it later transpired that Catherine would know more than she initially stated. Sometime in the weeks before Ruth's disappearance, something triggered a suspicion in her. The exact cause of this is either not known or the information is not being volunteered. Whatever the reason, Ruth was alleged to have travelled to London to view her mother Nesta's death certificate. What she found totally consumed her. Nesta hadn't died tragically breaking her neck by an accidental fall down the stairs. In fact, Nesta had taken her own life by hanging herself. Catherine claimed that this knowledge devastated Ruth, understandably, and that she felt her childhood was based on a foundation of secrecy and lies. Ruth apparently became obsessed with finding out the truth of what happened. Again, what Ruth's belief was either is not known or is not being told. Catherine continued, When you keep things like that from your kids, a mother killing herself a couple of weeks before Christmas with a one-year-old and a three-year-old, there was stuff in Ruth that made her want to know what happened. She was fixated on trying to find out. She had so much going on in her head that she was desperately trying to find out who she was. She was definitely working up to some kind of boiling point. She is quite volatile. She wouldn't hold back. During the filming of the documentary, Martin Bright informed both Ian Wilson and Surrey Police of the interpretations of Ruth's troubled family life. The Wilsons responded, quote, Her family are extremely hurt by this statement and do not recognise this view of Ruth's childhood. Ruth always knew about her biological mother's death, but not the exact cause. Sadly, we now know that before her disappearance, Ruth had discovered the tragic circumstances of her mother's death, but equally sadly, she chose not to discuss or question this with any family members. Chief Superintendent of Public Protection at Surrey Police, John Savile, confirmed that the force was aware of the situation and Ruth's knowledge of it, but strategically chose not to release that information to avoid potentially jeopardising the integrity of the investigation. Surrey Police further commented that it would not be appropriate to reveal certain information during the course of the investigation. Quote, we have made contact with a wide range of people who knew Ruth or had contact with her leading up to the time she was last seen. Much information has been gathered and the investigation remains open as Ruth has never been found. We remain in contact with Ruth's family and periodic reviews are undertaken to assess any new information that has come to our attention. In light of this, it would not be appropriate to disclose facts known to police whilst the case remains unsolved. To confirm, there is still uncertainty as to whether or not the case is still open, as there have been official comments to both effects. As a result of the documentary and subsequent renewed interest in Ruth's case, her friends and local acquaintances took to social media to discuss it. One friend, Ben Anderton, claimed she had run away from home for a week or so about a month previously and hinted about going away again a week or so before her disappearance, although Ruth apparently didn't divulge any details. He continued, quote, She hid out at mine when she first ran away. She wasn't happy at home and wanted to escape. However, sadly, despite the positivity brought by shining some new light on the situation, the negativity was also unearthed. Apparently, the Wilson family was asked if they were willing to appear on a game show where the audience would vote on the best step the family could take to try to get their daughter back. They declined. I can't verify the veracity of this statement and have absolutely no idea what kind of game show this would be. It is in very poor taste, if true. There are many theories in Ruth's case. John Stavolt. Chief Superintendent of Public Protection at Surrey Police, 
At the time of the last case review stated, as we know, there are five explanations for Ruth Wilson's disappearance. A tragic accident, abduction, suicide, murder, or that she had absented herself to start a new life. Each theory has its supporters and detractors, so let's discuss them one by one. Firstly, the possibility that Ruth had an accident, or that someone else had an accident that impacted on Ruth's ability to come home or make contact. Both journalist Martin Bright and ex-Surrey Police Family Liaison Officer Mark Williams Thomas have given credence to the belief that Ruth sadly may have met her demise on Box Hill one way or another. During the filming of the documentary, Martin said, quote, To be honest, Ruth could still be up there. A sentiment echoed by Williams Thomas, who put this possibility down to the inadequacy of the police inquiries. Though the police investigation has been complimented by as many as have criticised it, and some are loath to take his word for it given that he left the force under unclear circumstances. Not to mention that he himself was also reported to have said both that extensive searches across Box Hill had yielded no evidence to suggest that she was killed or committed suicide and that, from his experience, he would suggest one of two things occurred. She either went up there to meet somebody and has subsequently gone away, or she went there and died in some way. A big issue with this theory is that to date, nobody has been found. Many voiced their opinion that a body should certainly have been located by now, given the extent of the initial search and the capabilities of resources utilised. Dogs, helicopters and heat sensors are a convincing mix, not to mention the dog walkers, cyclists and tourists who visit the area daily. However, on the flip side, locals have been keen to note that the area where Ruth was dropped is closer to the back of the hill, in an area less frequented, and that there are dense areas of woodland that may be capable of concealing a body. For instance, Brian Heinard disappearance in 2011, and his remains were discovered on Box Hill two years later by a member of the public. The area also has some lakes, and there has been no record as to whether or not they have been searched. Other things working against this theory are the notes that are allegedly found and the flowers that were delivered. Why would the notes be there and the flowers be delivered two days later if an accident had befallen Ruth? It has been reported that three notes were found addressed to people known to Ruth, though the police have not confirmed their contents, only that they are ambiguous. And it was confirmed that Ruth had pre-ordered the flowers and given explicit delivery instructions. Second, the possibility that Ruth was abducted, either after making plans to meet with somebody under an alternative pretense, or by a random encounter that she was not anticipating. The main questions we need to consider under this theory are, did Ruth make arrangements to meet with somebody? If so, who? And for what purpose? How was Ruth acquainted with this individual? And who, if anybody, knew about it? It is known that Ruth often went to Box Hill after school and there are houses, a pub and various other establishments nearby from which Ruth could have met someone. Alternatively, the hill could have been a pre-arranged meeting place for somebody from elsewhere in her social circle. Ruth did have a very active life and her varied activities would have provided no shortage of connections. Back in 1995, the majority of households didn't have ready access to the internet, so it's unlikely she met somebody online, though this does pose the question as to what she was doing at the library so often. Her friend Catherine doesn't believe that Ruth went to Box Hill to meet with anybody, nor does she believe that there was a boyfriend in the picture. Quote, there was no man because we saw her at weekends. Personally, I don't necessarily believe that just because Ruth saw friends of a weekend means she wasn't seeing somebody else through the week or was in private communication with someone. It is unusual, though, if the girls were as close as Catherine makes out they were, that Ruth wouldn't have confided in her and hasn't been in touch with her since. Instead, Catherine believes Ruth chose the location to go to be alone and have a think and questions the likelihood of abduction, quote, all of a sudden, she goes up to Box Hill to disappear, and amazingly, somebody is there to abduct her. The Missing People charity does note the prevalence of human trafficking, as well as the risk of parental abduction and stranger abduction, though does explain that both are rare. Back in the 1990s, i.e. pre-9-11 days, 
there were fewer travel restrictions and less stringent checks. With it having been noted that travel from the UK to France or Ireland was relatively easy, even without a passport. Liam McCauley, who we've mentioned throughout in relation to the documentary, felt that Ruth was dressed to get into another car, suggesting the involvement of a third party, and also qualifies this possibility by further stating that, alone, how difficult is it for a 16-year-old girl to disappear completely? I would say it's nigh on impassable. Nobody can actually just vanish, especially given the lack of documentation or belongings. He outright states... I will tell you what my theory is. There is somebody from the community who is responsible for that wee girl going missing. I think something terrible has happened to her. Somebody knows where she is. His co-investigator for the documentary, Martin Bright, concurs. It looks to me that she met someone and something happened. Some members of the public in Dorking voiced their concerns to Martin Bright during the documentary's investigation saying that they felt that this couldn't possibly just have been a disappearance and suggested the possibility of abduction or murder. There are also a couple of significant roads very close by, which could make for an easy getaway if someone had picked Ruth up on Box Hill, the A24 and M25 being the major ones. For all we know, Ruth may have intended to hitchhike and got into the wrong vehicle. Although it is credible to suspect that Ruth may have been planning to leave on her own accord, there isn't exactly overwhelming evidence to suggest she meant to do so at this particular time. Her visits to Box Hill were consistent, <clears throat> even on the day she disappeared. Despite Ruth having not gone to school that day, she still went to the hill at the time she would normally have done so after school. She didn't empty her bank account, though we know she did spend money freely on taxis and flowers, and the notes do throw a bit of a spanner in the works. Again, Another person we've discussed throughout the episode is former family liaison officer Mark Williams Thomas. At different times, his theories seem to swing one way and then another, though he does state that there is no evidence to suggest that Ruth was killed or committed suicide at Box Hill. This does leave the possibility open for an abduction to have taken place, though he goes on to state that he was sure that Ruth was not abducted by a stranger. He doesn't discuss the possibility, however that Ruth may have been taken by someone she knew. Thirdly, the possibility that Ruth took her own life, either intentionally on Box Hill or subsequently after moving on to an unknown location. Both Martin Bright and Mark Williams Thomas have suggested the possibility that Ruth could still be up there on Box Hill, with Martin going on to declare, quote, I think she's probably dead, and William Thomas confirming his two theories. She either went up there to meet someone and has subsequently gone away, or she went there and died in some way. As we've mentioned previously, despite there being areas of the hill with massive footfall and tourist traffic, there are equally lesser frequented areas where a buddy could remain hidden for some time. We discussed earlier the case of Brian Hynett, whose remains were not located in the area for two years. With the scale and scope of the Surrey Police search efforts though, it is still a sticking point that no body has been located. The paracetamol, alcohol and notes would seem to suggest a more sinister outcome, though we need to question why the notes in particular were left allegedly hidden under a bush. It could not be guaranteed that they would be found, nor that they wouldn't be stumbled upon by somebody totally unconnected, who may not appreciate their significance. Was the bottle of alcohol vermouth or vodka it's been reported as both empty half empty or full i've seen it reported a couple of different ways we don't know if any forensics was done on the bottle to see if ruth's dna was on it and the same for the paracetamol or the pill packets whilst not releasing the contents of the notes police have stated that their meaning is ambiguous and that they are not necessarily suicide notes Additionally, the notes could easily have been posted, especially given that Ruth had arranged for flowers to be delivered in the early aftermath of her disappearance. The meaning behind the sending of the flowers has many people conflicted. Some people believe that they may have been Ruth's way of either apologising, saying goodbye, or even a token of thanks to her stepmother for stepping into her mother's shoes. Others, including her friend Catherine, believing 
believe instead that they carried a darker meaning, like, for example, sticking two fingers up. It has also never been confirmed what type of flowers were sent, as this may point towards one message over another. Some suggest that white lilies may represent a funerary link, whilst red roses may represent warmth and love, though clearly this is subjective. Another friend, Kay Blenard, states, My belief is that she had planned to do something. I don't know whether that would be permanent or temporary, suggesting the possibility of a permanent severance or departure. Ruth's own father, Ian, has proposed the notion that Ruth planned to commit suicide, but may have changed her mind at the last minute and moved on, fearing that she couldn't come home. He suggests her actions may have been a cry for attention. The family dynamic was difficult at the time, a time in Ruth's life where she would have been highly emotional for many reasons. Not only is she a teenager transitioning into a young woman, but we also now know that she uncovered the truth behind her mother's cause of death in the preceding weeks. We also don't know if there was a history of depression in the family. We can consider li the likelihood given the circumstances of Nesta's death, though there has been no suggestion of this manifesting in Ruth's life, with the exception of her having been described as unhappy and troubled, descriptors which could probably be appropriately ascribed to many teenagers. Personally, whilst I wouldn't want to judge anybody's method of grieving, I do find the timing of Ian's marriage to Karen disturbing. The two wed just a year after Nesta's death, meaning that either the relationship was still in its infancy when they did so, or alternatively suggests the possibility of an affair having commenced some time prior. Obviously, we don't know the specific reasons why Nesta chose the course of action she did, and can speculate endlessly on them. Some have suggested that there may have been more severe underlying issues in the marriage or household, which impacted on Nesta's choice. We don't know, though we also don't know the precise trigger for Ruth's sudden suspicion. It's not hard to imagine she may have felt isolated and that she couldn't discuss her concerns within her family due to the untruths that had been told to her. If Ruth's plan was to commit suicide though, surely it would have been far easier for her to have done so at home that day, where she could have assured that she would be found and which would send a much clearer message if that was indeed her intention. Though on this point, we should also consider that the family was religious, perhaps deeply so, with Ian later becoming a parish councillor. In certain religions, suicide is considered a sin, which would bar entry into the happily ever after. This might have been Ian's reason for not wanting to speak about it, and Ruth may have wanted to spare her family any more heartache. It could have gone either way. On the subject of religion, this may, to some degree, explain the statements made by the Wilson family in the aftermath of Ruth's disappearance. Many of their comments in open letters have drawn criticism in that they can be interpreted as being defensive and or blaming. For example, she chose not to, and your behaviour. If this was the prevailing attitude in the household, Ruth may have felt that she couldn't approach family members for support during the traumatic time that she was going through. Given that both Ian and Karen were teachers, this could also have, in Ruth's eyes, impacted on her ability to seek support from her own teachers, with the concern that information would make its way back to the Wilsons. Ruth's friend Catherine also moved to Sheffield, and despite the question being asked, it was not possible for Ruth to go with her at the time, and we also know that Ruth had separated from her boyfriend. It's easy to see, based on the prior, how Ruth may have felt isolated and wanted to leave, or perhaps worse. Though we should also consider that Catherine said Ruth had spoken about running away, though never about suicide, unless it was regarding her mother. Fourth, the possibility that Ruth was the victim of murder or other act of foul play, either by a random encounter or a deliberate act of deception by somebody she went to for assistance. The majority of both supporting and detracting points for this and the following theory have already been touched on in the previous three. As we've mentioned, extensive searches have not uncovered evidence of a body on Box Hill, though there are arguments both for and against the idea that one could actually be found with ease. Leah McCauley has suggested the involvement of a third party in Ruth's disappearance, 
noting the difficulty for a youngster to disappear entirely alone and for so long. Martin Bright also believes that someone else was responsible for, at the very least, Ruth's lack of subsequent communication with family or friends. Local Dorking community members have also speculated as to the likelihood of foul play, though many would not speak out openly about the case. We have discussed the ease of access to the roads leading from the area, along with the lack of preparation on Ruth's part. Yes, she did leave notes, as far as we are led to believe, and yes, she arranged for delivery of flowers, though there was no evidence of financial planning and nothing to suggest Ruth took any of her belongings with her. There was one sighting that alleged Ruth was seen walking with a suitcase, though nothing to substantiate that claim. We've discussed the theories and comments made by Mark Williams Thomas and the potential issues surrounding his credibility after his departure from the police force. We've analysed Catherine's comments. Despite the fact that she doesn't believe that Ruth succumbed to foul play, why did Ruth cease all contact with her if they were so close? Another of Ruth's friends, Roxy Birch, highlights that she couldn't drive, she didn't have a passport. So, as we've said, you have to ask the question, where could she have disappeared to for all these years? There are those with their suspicions about the taxi driver that allegedly dropped Ruth off at Box Hill on the day she disappeared. It is true that taxi drivers were less regulated at the time, and with no GPS data tracking of movements, it's very difficult. It's highly likely, though, that this line of inquiry was fully investigated at the time, and police have never questioned the veracity of the driver's statements. Additionally, details of when and where his next job was could likely have been available, possibly giving an alibi, etc. Without knowing the type of taxi, it's more difficult to analyse this idea. If the taxi was a private hire cab, there should be phone records or drop-in CCTV footage, if it was a hackney cab, there are fewer records still, though we do know that Ruth caught the cab from the train station, which should have had CCTV footage at the time. We can't explore this theory any further without more information. There have been a few alleged sightings of Ruth after she disappeared, some by people who were described as reputable, which would tend to conflict with this possibility. These ranged in distance from the local area to as far away as Canada. These have been followed up, but there has been nothing as yet to confirm any sightings. If foul play befell Ruth, then there are a number of suspects that may have had involvement. The suggestions are tenuous, so we won't go into much detail, but we will list them. The first is a serial killer from Scotland, who is currently serving out a whole life sentence for at least five murders. He was active between 1991 and 2008, that we know of, with the remains of two female teenagers found buried on his property. The girls had disappeared in 1991, just four years prior to Ruth, and at the time his home was in Kent, about 83 miles or 133 kilometres from Box Hill. He also had links to crimes committed in the Eastbourne area, which is about 60 miles or 97 kilometres away. The second suggests that the killer responsible for murdering 14-year-old Hannah Williams in 2001 was responsible also for Ruth's disappearance. Hannah disappeared from Dartford, about 37 miles or 60 kilometres from where Ruth went missing, though the culprit was known to have been acquainted with Hannah for two years prior to the murder. There was a conviction in the case and the individual has since died in prison. No formal suggestion as to his involvement has been made. In the same year, 2001, 15-year-old Danielle Jones disappeared from East Tilbury, Essex, about 50 miles or 80 kilometres from Box Hill. Sadly, Danielle has never been found, though her uncle has since been convicted of her murder and is currently imprisoned. It was revealed during the investigation that he had an obsession with teenage girls and had prior convictions for indecently assaulting them. Frustratingly, the individual involved will be able to be considered for parole from November 2021. As with the last, no formal link has been made between him and Ruth's disappearance. The following year, in 2002, 13-year-old Amanda Jane 
Millie Dowler disappeared just 10 miles or 16 kilometers away from where Ruth disappeared. She was sadly found deceased later the same year. A conviction was brought in the case and the murderer is currently imprisoned. It has been established that the same killer had been responsible for the murder of at least three other females and the attempted murder of another. The confirmed victims ranged in age between 13 and 22 and the individual has been named by police as a suspect in multiple unsolved murders and attacks on women dating back to 1990. He is also suspected of the murder of 14-year-old Patsy Morris in 1980. He will thankfully spend the rest of his natural life behind bars. Again, there has been no formal link between him and Ruth Wilson. It has also been suggested that a serial rapist and paedophile who was active in the Cheam, Surrey area between 1985 and 1990 may have been involved in Ruth's disappearance. The individual operated an unofficial youth club in outbuildings where he worked as a grave digger in St Dunstan's Churchyard, where he was said to prey on vulnerable and troubled girls aged between 11 and 15. His crimes were committed just 11 miles or 18 kilometres from Box Hill. He was later convicted and is currently in prison until 2023. As with all the prior cases, there has been no confirmed link between the individuals concerned and Ruth Wilson's disappearance. Sadly, though, it does show that the relative geographical location was, at the time, a particularly dangerous place for young girls. And finally, the possibility that Ruth left of her own accord to start a new life elsewhere, either alone or with the help of an accomplice. We have discussed in detail much of the points both for and against this theory throughout the previous, but we will just touch on some key points to support or detract from it. We know that Ruth was in the habit of spending time in the Box Hill area, as well as in the local library, in the weeks leading to her disappearance, where it is feasible that she may have met or connected with somebody. She was described by friends as troubled and unhappy at home, though this has been disputed by family. And we know that Ruth discovered the truth about her mother's death not long before she disappeared. Her mind was not in a great place and it seemed as though she felt like, for whatever reason, she couldn't work through these or at least discuss them with her family. Friends have confirmed that Ruth spoke about running away and there are elements of planning that would tend to support this. She ordered flowers to be delivered post-disappearance with no discernible reasoning and no card attached. Notes were found on Box Hill for people she knew and were described by authorities as ambiguous. This leads me to believe that they did not explicitly or potentially even implicitly discuss suicide. A lot of suicide notes are quite generic and will often attempt to explain why the individual has chosen to do what they have done. However, many can also be interpreted in different ways. For example, goodbye may mean that the individual has chosen to leave and cease contact rather than the more permanent option. We know that Ruth's friend Catherine had moved to Sheffield and that Ruth had asked if she could go with her. Her friend Roxy confirmed that Ruth had planned to disappear. Another friend, Kay, stated she believed Ruth had planned to do something. Perhaps Ruth chose to cease all contact as she may have felt let down by or disappointed in her social network. Those who she may be felt were in a position to help her. Ruth's other friend Ben still believes that Ruth is safe and well somewhere, noting that she'd run away from home for a week or so about a month previous and that she had hinted about going away about a week or so again before she disappeared. Ben reiterates the sentiment of other acquaintances when he says that Ruth was unhappy at home and wanted to escape. Catherine rejects the idea of a new relationship given the amount of time the girls spent together. Ruth was very intelligent and there have been sightings of her since her disappearance, although none have been substantiated. One sighting suggested she may have had a, a blue suitcase with her. Another tip placed her in Canada. We still don't know what triggered Ruth's suspicion when it came to her mother's death. And although various individuals have done significant research into Nesta's family life, she was adopted and her brother and father were deceased prior to her suicide. There is the possibility that Ruth managed to contact some of her mother's family or acquaintances who may have assisted her or vice versa. 
It does pose the question as to why Ruth wouldn't contact her sister, though. The Missing People charity have conducted vast research and studies have shown that only 1% of children who go missing remain so for over a year, though they do clarify that this still equates to hundreds of cases. Further detail shows that 71% of runaways aged between 13 and 17 are female. Though the Centre for Missing and Exploited Children also produced a report in which it was cited that between 2011 and 2016, only 56 children who had been gone longer than 20 years returned. Leah McCauley believes there is a third person involved in Ruth's disappearance and suggests that she was dressed to get into another car and that running away seemed more likely than suicide. Mark Williams Thomas has also offered his theories in the case. I would suggest one of two things occurred. She either went up there to meet someone and has subsequently gone away, or she went there and died in some way. Though he seems to narrow these down further in other comments, uh, extensive searches in the area have failed to turn up any evidence that Ruth is there. One Reddit user managed to locate the case of Crystal Harg. In 1997, at the age of 14, Crystal spontaneously ran away from home, taking no belongings with her. Somehow, over the course of two decades, she managed to create or obtain a new identity, with which she got a job and ultimately went on to have a family of her own. So although Leah McCauley puts little credence into this, this possibility, we can see that whilst it may not be easy or common, it most certainly is possible. Overseas travel was less stringent at the time, and it is feasible that Ruth could have left the UK and travelled to France, Ireland, and from there on to anywhere, really. Interestingly, other Reddit users have made connections between Ruth's disappearance and a couple of songs. Public Image Limited released a song in 1981 called The Flowers of Romance on a self-titled album, which speaks of Box Hill, sending flowers and starting again. I sent you flowers. You wanted chocolates instead. The flowers of romance. The flowers of romance. I've got binoculars on top of Box Hill. I could be Nero, fly the eagle, start all over again. I can't depend on these so-called friends. NME named the album as the 15th best album of the year, with the single reaching number 24 in the UK charts. The band were on tour in 1992, coming to London in May of that year. It's not entirely out the realm of possibility that Ruth, who was, as we know, a great lover of music and played the electric guitar, could have either seen the band or heard the song between 1992 to 1995, which may have provided certain inspiration for her. The artist Ben Watt of Everything But The Girl fame also released a song in 1983 called On Box Hill. Right up here and far away from everything, Right up here, there's nothing that can touch me now. The only thing that stabs my back is spiky grass. The only thing that makes me fall is liberty. On Box Hill, stand still. On Box Hill, here until. The band played various dates in the UK, many in London, in the early 1990s, right up to June of 1995. So again, it is possible that Ruth had heard the song though both songs could equally be of no relevance to the case whatsoever. It's also interesting to note the striking similarities between Ruth's case and that of Andrew Gosden. He was also a young teenager who, for unknown reasons, decided not to go into school one day and instead travelled with unknown intentions. Both youngsters were highly intelligent and, sadly, neither have been seen since. Just as we have had a significant number of theories in this case, thankfully there are also a number of positive things which have been highlighted in the wake of Ruth's tragic disappearance. The initial investigation by Surrey Police was criticised, though significant improvements have been made to the way they now handle missing persons cases. Detective Chief Superintendent Craig Denham said that a lot was learned from Ruth's case, which helped the investigation into Millie Dowler's disappearance in 2002. Within days of Millie's disappearance, we had the three elements of our command strategy in place, made up of the investigation, 
the search and the media strategy. An in-depth risk assessment was introduced, taking into account the person's age, family and personal history, mental health and patterns of behaviour, which is used to more accurately gauge the vulnerability. This, in turn, directs the investigation. Cray continued, It is complicated. A young girl who has never run away before and takes no clothes with her is obviously at risk. But there are dangers of working with checklists. A streetwise young boy in care who has run away a hundred times and always returned may be equally at risk. The Surrey Police website also has a very good missing persons information page linked below, which contains a lot of useful information ranging from missing children to the missing elderly. There, they answer a lot of frequently asked questions and suggest a variety of support services, as well as offer advice on what the family can do and what they can expect of the police. Surrey Police also have an initiative called Operation Make Safe. The website describes it as an initiative focused on making sure that people working in the business sector are aware of the early warning signs of child sexual exploitation, CSC, and when necessary, alert police officers to intervene to stop any young person coming to harm. The site asserts that CSC can take place in any number of places and local establishments, and specifically notes that taxis can also be used to transport young people who are subsequently exploited. This is obviously particularly relevant in Ruth's case. There are a number of resources available on the website, linked below, from downloadable posters to training sheets. The motto is, say something if you see something. Further on from Make Safe is the Operation Sports Safe initiative. Again, reading from the website, due to an increased number of disclosures in recent years, safeguarding children in sport is in national focus, and for the first time, sports clubs and organisations have been included in the statutory guidance, Working Together to Safeguard Children 2018. We want to ensure sports clubs are informed and equipped on how to safeguard children. It is exactly the same as Make Safe, but specifically encompasses sports clubs, etc. Due to the prevalence of missing elderly people suffering from dementia, various police forces throughout the UK have adopted the Herbert Protocol. Reading from the Safeguarding Hubs website, the Herbert Protocol is a simple risk reduction tool to be used in the event that an adult with current support is reported missing. It is named after George Herbert, a war veteran of the Normandy landings who lived with dementia. It can be used for other vulnerabilities. The protocol consists of a simple form that contains valuable information about the person that can be passed to the police at the point they are reported missing. The protocol operates within many areas. Ask your police force, doctor's surgery or local authority if they subscribe to the scheme and request a form. Further information can be found on the internet. I will now leave you with the description of Ruth and some final words from those involved in the case. At the time of her disappearance, Ruth was a 16-year-old Caucasian female with a fair complexion. She was described as 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 3 inches or about 157 centimetres tall with dark brown shoulder length hair and blue eyes. Ruth normally wore metal rimmed glasses and was last seen wearing a red knitted jumper, black velvet trousers, black pixie boots and a small lady's watch on her left wrist. If seen today, Ruth would be 41 years old. Spokespeople from Surrey Police have said that the case has not been forgotten and could be reopened at any time. Quote, All our unsolved cases are reviewed on a regular basis and the investigation would be reopened if any new evidence or lines of inquiry came to light. As we know, there has been some conflicting information as to whether or not the case is actually open. This make it sound like it's not, though. The spokespeople added, Surrey Police continues to keep an open mind about what happened to Ruth following her disappearance in November of 1995. We would also urge anyone who believes they have new information which could help the investigation to come forward. Surrey Police remains keen to hear from anyone who has information that may assist with finding Ruth. If you can help, please contact us, quoting Operation Scholar. 
The contact information will, as usual, be in the description box down below. The Wilson family have sporadically commented on Ruth's case, with one of their open letters reading, Dear Ruth, your disappearance is still a mystery. The congregation at the local church still prays for you every week. There have been many false leads. We want you to know that while we miss you desperately and want to know you're fine, we have never been angry with you, whatever prompted you to go that day. We are just so sad that a big chunk of your life has been lived without us. There is nothing to forgive. Mum and I simply want to put our arms around you and tell you how much we love you. All any parent wants is for their child to be happy. Knowing you are safe and well, even if you don't want to come home, would make me the happiest man in the world. Other comments made by the family include, We just want Ruth to know we love and miss her and urge her to get in touch. We do not want to put pressure on her to return home, but we need to know that she is safe. We know the longer it goes on, the harder it would be for Ruth to come home, but she would be showered with love and kisses if she walked through the door today. It is not her fault. We love you and think about you every day. Our greatest wish is that you are safe and happy and that one day you will make contact and be part of our life again. We have never stopped loving you. Whatever the issue that drove you away or you found difficult to cope with, we will do everything in our power to sort it out. We cannot really go ahead until we know where Ruthie is. In the dark moments, you believe she can't possibly be alive. Other times, you are convinced she is out there somewhere. We want to tell her, we love you so much. Just get in contact, Ruthie. Let us know where you are. Sergeant Shane Craven, head of the East Surrey Missing Persons team, stated, We hope that someone who knew Ruth and felt that, for whatever reason, they could not share the information they had about her whereabouts at the time of her disappearance, is now able to do so. Whoever that might be, we are appealing to your conscience for you to please come forward. It is impossible to imagine the heartache that Ruth's family and friends must have endured over the years. If you are in a position to help relieve some of the strain with whatever information you might have, then I would urge you to do so. We would also be interested in hearing from anyone who thinks that they might have met or seen Ruth at any point in the years since her disappearance. Although she is unlikely to closely resemble the most recent photo we have of her, there is a chance that someone out there knows somebody who could be Ruth. As for those involved in the recent documentary, Liam McCauley has poignantly said, The way the police are being tight-lipped is just adding to the mystery. If this keeps on, the file on Ruth will lie yellowing in a filing cabinet and one day will just be incinerated. And her friend Catherine noted, Some people may ask, what is the point of bringing all this up again? But something doesn't feel right. So thank you for joining me again for this episode and for taking some time to hear about Ruth. And I will look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye.